Hello and welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm Jamie Hopkins, one of your two co-hosts for this episode, and we're in our retirement income series and really kind of kicking us off here with a discussion about retirement income process. Somebody who's been on the show before, Dana, really excited to have you back on. And I know you just presented, so you, you've probably got that presentation high here, right? You're riding off of that. And you're going to lead us through this amazing conversation today, but it's great to see you. Thanks for taking time out to join Devin and I here on the show. You're welcome. Welcome. It's great to be here. Yeah, I think last time we did something together, it was virtual. So being in person is nice, uh, you know, but uh, you're always a fantastic presenter. And somebody was actually asking me uh, just yesterday, people I admire in this industry. And uh, unfortunately, they were like, your list is kind of short, but you were on that list. So like, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, always wanted to be famous for retirement income. Yeah. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Well, we'll get into that, but we like to start off with a conversation about food. And I know that you uh, answered this once before, but uh, Nashville is a great food city. So we could even, uh, if you want to pivot from your favorite food, but what's kind of speaking to you right now about food? Well, I, I don't remember what I answered last time, but I was going to answer cheese. Oh. And I wonder if that's what I said. Do you remember? I don't know. But I cheese don't. is so <laughs> versatile. I love cheese. You can you know, have it with pineapple on pizza. You can have it on Mexican food. It's like cheese. Macaroni and cheese is what would speak to me here in uh, Nashville. Yeah. I, I Just on Saturday, I made a, a, what, a carbonaro <gasps> pasta, which, you know, I had not done before. Um, I've had it. I like it. And then, uh, you know, a the, uh, Shauna was uh, said she had a great frozen one, and I was like, "All right, I gotta make it." So then I I hand cut the pasta, and like that was a whole thing. But yeah, like I had like a bunch of different cheeses, and you're grating the cheeses. It turned out really well. I didn't have as much pepper as I would have liked in it because I've got three young kids, and we don't make special food for them. So five, four, and three, they eat everything, but like really spicy or a ton of pepper. So I scaled that back a little bit. But uh, yeah, it was good. So it was a lot of cheese. Well, carbonara is one of my my favorites. Did you bring any? I didn't, but if you're ever in Philadelphia, I will remake it. I've gotten a lot of requests to remake it now. Um, and I, I'm a pretty big foodie and I'm getting pretty good. Like I've shifted to pastas lately. I don't know why, but it's uh, that's my thing as of right now. So <laughs> I have to ask, are there any unacceptable forms of cheese? I mean, like... I mean, string cheese isn't the best, but I mean, if that's all the cheese I got, I'll eat it. If you're running through the airport, right? You're mm -hmm. one of those vendors and you get string cheese, that's what you get. But other than that, no, not really. Yeah, you're right. It is totally versatile. It goes on everything and it's awesome. It's delicious. Except Asian food. You don't see cheese on Asian food. Right, not ever. a lot. Yeah. I don't know I'm why. trying to think of what dishes might have it, but yeah, not as much, right? No, not as much. Yeah. So um, so you're in the retirement income space. You're heavily involved in education. You've written a book. You've developed your practice around this concept. How did you get started? Why, why this particular topic? And why did you build your entire practice around it? Yeah, it's a great question. As I was joking with Jamie, I always wanted to be famous for retirement income. No, that is not what I set out to do. But I it was around 2003, 2004, I was working for a CPA firm. And this couple came in, they reminded me of my grandparents, they were about 65. And they had maybe a half a million dollar portfolio at the time. And they brought in 10 years worth of statements from their broker that they worked with. And they had made no money. And at that point, the the 10 year prior returns, I mean, if you had just plugged someone into a 60 40 portfolio, their portfolio should have doubled easily <laughs> over that 10 year time frame. And so I was like, wow, what happened? And every time they expressed a concern, their their person would just move their money. So, you know, they were concerned about stocks and, and they happened to move them into bonds. And so that was right before an interest rate increase. And then the bond portfolio went down. They were concerned that that happened because they thought bonds were safe. So they moved them all into a fixed annuity. And so it had just been this very reactionary response. And I just remember it triggered something in me. I was like, you know, the stakes are higher. These people can't go back to work. They're retired. It, it shouldn't be this way. Like, we should have a different standard. It's one thing to make a bad investment or a bad set of choices. And nothing was really bad. It just, it wasn't good. It wasn't good advice. They didn't take the time to educate and, and explain things to, to the customer. So, so that's how it started. I started a deep dive on retirement. How do you make cash flow sustainable? How do you do things differently for, for this segment? Because the stakes are, are truly higher. 
And when you started, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of research or, or uh, really conversations around this particular topic at the time. Uh, where did you go to find all the, you know, the, the, the knowledge and expertise and skills and abilities that you've developed? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because Google wasn't as prevalent as it is today either. So, you know, I actually just found everything I could. And I actually then I rode dirt bikes at the time and I broke my wrist in 2006 and wrote my own book. So I wrote a book on sequence risk called Sensible Money. Uh, I didn't know anything about marketing or the Internet. So three (laughs) people bought it ever. And so it was was really interesting. The content was good, but I didn't, didn't know how to get it out there. And I was looking for more and more things to to you know how do I add to this body of knowledge how do I find more and I found an organization called the Retirement Income Industry Association and started traveling to their conferences um, they were just beginning to offer a designation called the Retirement Management Advisor designation so I went down that path and found a collection of people that I called called it you know my fellow retirement income geeks people that had PhDs and CFAs and and it wasn't the typical sales material that I had been exposed to prior in my career. They were people really passionate about solving this decumulation problem. And so we would email and share resources. And, and it was like grassroots at the time. It really felt like grassroots. Did you, uh, did you, I guess you didn't search optimize your book on like Ask Jeeves back then, right? Like <laughs> no. you're like, no, it just wasn't happening yet. <laughs> No, what what happened? I ended up um, starting to write for, it was called about.com at the time. So I was their money over 55 expert and they had a very wide distribution uh, channel. And so when I started doing that, I actually took my book down because it wasn't professionally done. I was, you know, I I look at how my writing's improved, like so many things we do in life, right? You start with something and it gets better and better. But at the time I decided, you know, I'm going to wait until I can really know what I'm doing before I put something back out there. And is that the one that became the balance? Is that the one? It did. Yeah. So about.com got, it was owned by the New York Times when I started writing for them. And then it got bought by a company called IAC mm-hmm. and they own match.com and a bunch of other internet properties. Yeah. So then yeah. you were like, I, I went from writing from the New York Times to match.com. Huh? It didn't have quite the same <laughs> feeling to it. No. <laughs> yeah. It's a, I, I wrote a little bit for the balance and I think about before that's what I, that's what I remember from that experience is when it shifted over. And I remember, I think you probably remember this too, that and like they had two portals you had to log into. Do you remember that when it, like it first switched and you had to update an article? There were actually like two different portals you had. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah. I've blocked it. I remember <laughs> one portal that. D- yes, actually, yeah, now you I had do. to log into two separate yes. portals to update the article because like the editors put notes in one and then yes. you uploaded it in a separate one. Yeah, it yes. was really fun. <laughs> that was right around the time where I was like, I don't think this is for me anymore. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's been interesting. Yeah, the because uh, those get updated too, and I, your name's still on them right and now there's like other people that do updates it's a very interesting thing it, a few times a year i'll get an email from an attorney or a fellow advisor with a question on on a piece of mm-hmm. my content that was updated sometimes incorrectly yeah. they did uh put me in touch with an editor and to their credit if i email them and say hey this isn't yeah. quite right they, they fix it very quickly but yeah uh, it is it can be frustrating at times yeah Well, let's talk about the retirement income process. Uh, You know, you were talking about, you know, kind of going through RMA and then in your book, building it out. And you've continued to build that out over the years, too. And there aren't a lot of processes out there on this. And, you know, when I was at the college, which is a little bit later, kind of 2012 range, we were building out a retirement income process for a different program. But um, and I, I wrote a book on it and those things. But like when I was looking at our CFP materials, like there was no retirement income in there. There wasn't a process for it. There was mm-hmm. a planning process, but not an income process. So tell me a little bit about the process that you kind of helped develop and then now have kind of taught to lots of advisors and uh, individuals. Yeah. So there's a lot to it. So so let me kind of start with a lot of it came around mistakes mm-hmm. that were made. So like so many <laughs> of us, right, you do something and you think, wow, that, that could have been better. And so I think particularly as you work with higher net worth clients, nobody likes to do budgeting, right? So we don't want to dig into a client's expenses and sometimes it can be uncomfortable. But one of the biggest mistakes that I saw, particularly after 2008 and nine, were everybody was fine, their plan was fine if they stuck with their investment plan. It was people who overspent. 
And so there were certain things that we hadn't asked about or that they forgot to build into their spending. So prior to that, I might ask just in general, you know, how much do you need to live on? And they throw out a number mm -hmm. and they forget things like uh, new car purchases, a new roof that needs to be on the house, travel, things maybe that they weren't used to budgeting for on a monthly basis. Some people get bonuses and stock options. And so they're used to paying for those things with these this extra income, I'll call it, that comes in and they forget that they won't have that extra income in retirement, but they, they still want to spend these things. So that's just one example of, you know, some things that changed as my process developed. So when we start our process, it's like anyone, we do a lot of information gathering, but we do spend a lot of time on getting the cash flows right. And we break our process into a series of three strategy meetings. And there's specific topics that we cover it at each of those meetings. In the first one, Prior to that meeting, we've gathered information on all of their income and expenses, and we call it the big picture, right? Approximately, given your level of spending and this set of cash flows that'll be coming in from Social Security or pension or whatever else you may have, does your plan work? And we use a Monte Carlo analysis as part of that. So it's really big picture. We don't dial into uh, any kind of tax management or trying to improve the outcome. It's just really big picture, picture terms, does this work? If it doesn't, we will spend a lot of time digging into the budget side of their plan. So, you know, would you be able to spend less? Let's take a deeper dive on your spending. In that process, we also spend time on inflating different things at different rates. So there's basic living expenses that will inflate at 3% and healthcare related expenses will use 5% on Part B premiums, out of pocket costs, those kinds of things. And then if they have a mortgage, we'll separate out the principal and interest portion because it's fixed mm -hmm. from the taxes and insurance, we'll add inflation to that. So it's, it's pretty detailed and even that is far more detailed than I ever would have done prior because Somebody wants to know that they can cover their same lifestyle. I mean, that's usually the goal. How do I transition in, into retirement and cover my same lifestyle? So strategy one, really big picture. Strategy two, we explained to the client, we're going to dive into all of the non-investment levers that could potentially improve your outcome. It might be claiming Social Security, so coming up with a customized strategy. It might be what age should you start your pension and what survivor options should you take. It might be a deferred comp plan where we may be adjusting, uh, if possible, how that deferred comp is going to come back out because that's going to impact when and how it hits the tax return. So we're working with, as, as we describe it, all the non-investment levers. It might be Roth conversions that we're adding in. So, And we have a, a set of metrics we use that that we can see, did this decision improve the client's outcome, agnostic of any investment decision that's made. And so we work through all of those decisions with the clients. And then it's not till strategy three that, that we then get into the investing side. And so we think of that as the very last piece that we put in place. So here's what amount of money is going to come out of which account based on the most tax efficient. I say the most, nobody really knows what the most tax efficient is, but based on more tax efficient than, than some baseline version. And so we've, we've dialed all of that in. And now the last piece is how do I align the portfolio to that set of cash flows? In consumer language, we'll talk about, you know, you know each account has a job to do. Mm -hmm. So this financial plan is a job description. I now know maybe money's going to come out of this IRA, but if there's an age difference between the spouses, we might not be taking money out of the second IRA for 10 years. So they shouldn't be allocated the same. In some cases, money might be coming out of a trust account first and, and the IRAs later. We might not be touching the Roths at all. So each account will have its own investment approach and its own allocation that's that's tied to that financial plan. So it's a very comprehensive process, as you can imagine from, from me describing it, but we break it into those three meetings. One, so it's digestible for us, but also so it's digestible for the client. They have, I mean, people can't handle more than about an hour of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes glaze over. So they can, can digest it and they get reports afterward, come back with questions, and then we move on to the next piece. It, it strikes me as a very client-oriented conversation you're having. And many, many times they might be learning some of this stuff for the first time. Uh, what what are they learning during this experience as you're kind of breaking all of this stuff down for them? It, I mean, they learn a lot. We intentionally build an in education into our process because I think 
like all of us, if we know the why, we're more likely to do it and stick with it versus if someone just tells us, here's the plan. So there is a lot of education at each of those meetings. I, I would say they learn the interaction of the variables. So clients will see how a 1% change in the assumed rate of inflation can impact the outcome. We will demonstrate how working a year or two longer or not can impact the outcome. We'll demonstrate how a $10,000 a year change in spending might impact the outcome. So there's all kinds of things that help that light bulb come on for them. So they kind of see how all of these different things interact and that they have choice. So some people really are ready to be done. And we might be the ones to say, well, you can be if you're willing to reduce your spending by, you know, 10,000 a year. And some people are like, all right, I'm doing it. I'll downsize the house. I'll move <laughs> to a different state. I'll do whatever it takes. And other people will look at the same numbers and say, there's no way. You know, I still want to travel to Italy every year. I want to buy, you know, this type of vehicle. And so if that means I need to work for five more years, then so be it. So it puts people at choice. We try not to bring our values to the table, but really to say, how do we use this financial plan to illustrate these these choices that you have? I think it's really interesting how you've kind of broken it across three different areas, right? Kind of the cash flow, the strategies, and then the investments. Um, why did you kind of move investments, I think, to the third one, right? Because <laughs> uh, obviously you probably tried it different ways at first, right? And you found that, hey, this kind of works well um, later on. And then, you know, I guess the add-on to that question. So I always ask two questions at once, right? It, <laughs> which is the, you know, how, how did you view investments different in this distribution phase than the savings phase? Yeah. So the first part of that question, amazingly enough, we didn't try it differently. Okay. Once we really started this process, it was more of a, well, I wouldn't even know what to do with your investments unless I had this cash flow plan first, because we believe in aligning the portfolio specifically to the cash flows that it needs to, to produce. Now, if I was working with a 40 year old who has 20 years left until retirement, it's different, right? The traditional way I was taught to do it, you, you have your clients answer a risk tolerance questionnaire and, ch -ch 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 and out comes 70, 30 or 60, 40 or 80, 20 or whatever. Well, they don't have cash flows that are coming out. They only have cash flows going in. And so for us with clients that are almost exclusively within 10 years, sometimes five years, one year are already retired, they have cash flows coming out. So we couldn't think of any other way to do it. I have to know when Social Security is going to start because if they're going to delay till 70, then I'm going to need more cash flows from the portfolio early on. I have to know when their pension's going to start. So if they're going to, some people retiring at 60, their pension's not going to start till 65. You know, I need more cash flows for those first five years and then maybe the pension kicks in and, and I need less cash flows and then Social Security kicks in and I need even less. So we wouldn't be able to even begin with the investment discussion and, until we had that. So that's really how it came about. It's also, to me, the lever we have the least control over. So as we explain to clients, you know, we don't have control over inflation, the economy, the markets. When we study market returns, and my first book was on sequence risk, and, and, and we look at so much of it is what was the year you retired? You know, did you retire in 2007, right before the great financial crisis? Did you retire in 1970 or 69, right before that big market crash? Or did you retire in the 80s, right before things took off? And so we don't have control over what kind of conditions you're going to get. And so we want to focus on all of these other levers, your spending, how you withdraw, we can't control tax rates, but we can manage taxes. We can strategically decide what to use and in what order. So that that's the first part of your question, yeah. right? That's that's how <laughs> it came last. The second part of your question was. Well, I'll, I'll we'll come back to that okay. because you just brought up a really good kind of, uh, I guess, uh, example of what you call kind of coordinated, right? Like what you just described was, you we actually do have to coordinate all this together. They're not silos, right? The right. investment decision is not a silo from Social Security, nor is it from the pension or the Roths, right? That yes. they're all together. And so you've used that language before too, right? Like coordinated strategy. So, yes. Uh, just describe that a little bit more for me, and then we'll get back to the investment piece. Yeah. So well, the coordination for us even comes down to, you've heard the go-go years, the slow-go years, the no-go years. So, you know, 
many clients will say, well, yeah, of course, I'd like to leave something to my children, but that's not my top priority. And so we might come back in and say, well, great. You know, during your 50s and and 60s, you're going to have more energy. You're going to travel more. We'll build in go-go spending. Well, I need more withdrawals from the portfolio to support that level of spending, particularly if I'm also delaying Social Security. And so then we know not only from the research, but I've had clients I've worked with for 20 years. Every single one of them slows down when they hit their 70s. I mean, it's not just something we read about in research papers. It's reality. They don't travel as much. They don't entertain as much. They don't eat out as much. And so their spending will slow down. And so uh, when I say coordinated, it's around all of those things. If I take money out of the IRA, uh, it's going to be at one tax rate. If they're already collecting Social Security, it's going to potentially make more of their Social Security taxable. And so we have to know after tax, what is the retirement paycheck they're going to get? That's what our clients care about, right? (laughs) They want all the rest to be taken care of. And they want to know after tax, I want to have this available to spend. And, you know, how are you going to make it happen? And I want to know it can happen and that I have 100% confidence that it'll last for life. And that I'm not going to be sitting there across from that client when they're 80 years old going, you know, well, sorry, I I forgot about this in your plan. And so you're, you're not going to make it. I've noticed you've used that term multiple times, this paycheck replacement, this, uh, you know, around the, the three steps that you do are all around income and, and paychecks. Is is there a behavioral reason why you focus on the paycheck piece? Is it, is it more because it's a familiar concept to them already? Uh, what, what do you find resonates with this just concept of paycheck replacement for these folks? I think people relate to it. I used retirement paychecks for a long time. It's you know, even to the point of even high net worth clients, our, our retired executives, when we get to the point of them taking withdrawals, we'll often say, okay, we're going to set up this direct deposit to you. And it can come once a month or twice a month, the first and the 15th or the fifth and the 20th. And they love it. I mean, that's how we're all used to budgeting for, for the most part. So it feels familiar. It, we're all used to withholdings coming out of our paycheck already. And so we can tell them we've withheld this much for quarterly taxes or that's if it's from an IRA, it's going right to taxes. And here's what you've got to spend. Some clients we create kind of a separate bucket, I'll call it, for major things. So you've got this much in, in your monthly paycheck and this much that you can ask us for on demand for vacations or for the car. And they they love it. I mean, it's just like they're used to when you're working. They had a paycheck and then they might have bonuses or stock options maturing. And so it's, it is familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was just sitting here thinking and it was, it reminded me of something because it's like, hey, is that a familiar concept? And all of a sudden I was thinking, well, you know, people today actually don't get checks anymore. So, like, there will be a time period where we're going to be like, hey, you know, like your paycheck. And somebody's going to be like, checks? Like, what is a <laughs> check, right? And right. I, I remember because we were, somebody was building a course when I was, uh, like, it was like 2016 or 17, and they were using this bank teller example. And I was like, that's a terrible example now. And they're like, why? And I was like, nobody goes to bank teller. I mean, not, not completely, but, like, I haven't been inside of a bank Minus like one time in the last like six years, right? And it's like, I don't interact with bank tellers anymore. Deposits go electronically, right? And now the apps can do so many more things. So it's a, you know, I wonder if it becomes your retirement deposit or whatever instead yeah. long term. But yeah, language is, is such an interesting thing as we c- have to communicate all this. Well, and advisors often don't meet the clients at their language, you know, yeah. so a client will come to an advisor and they say, okay, well, where's my paycheck going to come from? And the advisor will launch into some like sophisticated technical, <laughs> you know, technique of the bond portfolio and all this stuff. But literally what they're asking is no, no, I mean like, where does my paycheck, like, are you going to just deposit it into my account? Yeah. You know, like it's, it's the, you know, we don't reach the client at the, at the level that they're asking us those questions. That is so true. And we'll see that, you know, with some clients, you know, advisor might say, oh, well, you know, just tell us when you need money and we'll send it to you. And we're like, no, it doesn't work that way. That does not make the client feel comfortable. Yeah. It really doesn't. They want that, you know, paycheck and whether the language changes, it may, yeah. uh, even if it comes by direct deposit, I think we still call them paychecks. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And yeah. It is. Yeah. The, uh, and that's a really just kind of interesting piece too, right? Which is that like, people don't like that uncertainty, you know, like it, like just, oh, whatever it's going to come, right? Like, 
No, I just, you know, like if your employer, you were like, yeah, well, like, what do I get paid? <laughs> well, like, whenever you need money, just let us know. We'll, we'll like put it in your bank, right? You'd be like, I don't think this job is for me, <laughs> like for anybody, right? You'd be like, no, I think we're good, actually. Like, I'm going to go find a job elsewhere. Uh, so I will round back to the question. See, this is why I shouldn't ask two questions at once, because then we forget. And then 10 minutes later, we're like, what were we talking about? But I did want to ask about, you know, how do you view investments differently in the savings versus the spending phase, right? And how do you then communicate that? You're, you're talking a little bit about, you know, a younger person is approaching yeah. it differently than somebody five to 10 years from retirement. And obviously sequence of returns is a big topic for you too. Yeah. Well, I, I think of it, you know, in the traditional sense, when you're younger, the efficient frontier and maximizing risk for a given level of return, I think it works really well. So I like to tell my own story. I turned 51 this year and I plan to work till I'm 70, but just like my clients and all the research shows, most of us retire earlier than we planned. So I'm going to start my portfolio transition at 55 in anticipation of a potential age 65 retirement. And so here's how I think of it differently. Right now, I'm 100% equity. I'm comfortable being 100% equity. I understand the volatility in the markets. I want to maximize return. I'm not concerned about risk because I think of volatility as more around the impact that it has on when I will need to use the money. And I won't need to use that money anytime in, in the next 15 years. And so when I turn 55, however, and I'm within that 10 year window, I will lay out what I need to withdraw if I were to retire at 65. And that amount of my portfolio, I'll shift from equity into a bond or CD that's going to mature the year I turn 65. And then a year later, when I'm 56, I'll do that again. And a year later, I'll do it again. And by the time I actually get to 65, I will have this 10-year runway of mm -hmm. bonds or CDs maturing that will provide a level of cash flow. It will be the paycheck replacement part of my portfolio. And so I think of it as that shift in retirement is really around, you know, how do you protect certainty of outcome? So we were talking about that a little bit before we even started recording is, you know, how do you protect a more certain outcome in retirement? And that is a very different thing than how do you maximize returns? Uh, that's exactly right. And, and it's the, those, again, going back to familiarity, uh, those are concepts that I think most clients sort of understand and appreciate. And so they, they become very, I assume they become pretty receptive around that type of conversation. Not only do they, do they become receptive, but a lot of times they're interviewing us and several other advisors and you will hear them say, wow. Like this resonates. We've heard, you know, we've interviewed five different advisors and what you talk about is different. And so they will feel that our focus, well, they know our sole focus is decumulation. We talk about it differently because that is what we do. So, so they very much resonate it and they're looking for something other than the same kind of things. I mean, you can't, the media is nuts if you tried to rely on that for your investment advice. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> You've talked about uh, volatility there and sequence risk um, and, and kind of framed it up differently, right? During this, uh, you know, savings and accumulation period, you're willing to take that, you know, risk, right? Because you understand that you don't need the money yet. So how do you, th how do we need to redefine what risk means when we head into retirement, right? Like, how is it different for us at that point than it is during a savings period? Well, so it's interesting. I use this slide in this presentation I just did, and I had two portfolios, and one uh, was yellow on the screen, and it, it, you know, wiggled up and down, up and down by a pretty wide margin, and uh, but basically it maintained a, a certain range of value, mm -hmm. and the other one was blue on the screen, and it wiggled a little bit, but not nearly as much as the yellow one, and it slowly declined over time, and I asked this room full of advisors which portfolio is riskier. And interestingly enough, the sentiment has changed. In the past, I would get about 50-50. So 50% 50 of the audience would say that the yellow portfolio was more risky and 50% and would say the blue. And today, almost everybody said that the blue portfolio was riskier because it was slowly running out of money over time. Now, our traditional way of viewing risk is by volatility. And by that standard, the yellow portfolio would be more risky. And as I say, the answer is really how you define risk. And so as you're talking about, you know, how do you redefine risk? Well, I would define risk as running out of money. Yeah. So 
you know, it's not volatility. It's around how do I protect this person's lifestyle or even if we were to get an Armageddon scenario, right? How do I protect a minimum level of consumption that they can have? Because that's the real risk is, you know, none of us wants to be later in life going, oh my gosh, I, yeah. I didn't get it right. So I, I love those examples too, because immediately in my mind, I said, well, you know, my na natural attorney answer was like, well, it depends, right? Because, <laughs> you know, if you added that and uh, like, let's say that one had a lot of volatility and it was an accumulation period, we might say that the declining one is the riskier one because it's running out of money. But if we had to take distributions from one of them, a declining portfolio, right, that's a little flatter over time might actually outlast that increasing one, right, with more volatility. Because if you have to dr draw, and you get the bad year and you draw from it early when it drops a lot, even though over time it might go up, we could end up with a faster depletion, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely you can. And, <laughs> and so something that appears safer could actually be riskier depending on how you define the goal. Yeah, no, I love that. That's uh, But what's, I, what stands out is that it's it's focusing on the outcome uh, is, as opposed to mm -hmm. probabilities. Because humans don't really think in probability terms very well. It's a very abstract thing. But the financial industry, that's when we talk about risk, that's all we talk about is probabilities and drawdowns and standard deviations and about a thousand other metrics for that. But you found that focusing on the outcome and kind of this, this goals-based oriented approach, again, resonates much more and is, is more easy to, to communicate to clients um, and, and persuade them to make other types of decisions. It is. And I mean, clients are very outcome focused in terms of their paycheck, as we all are while we're working, right? You know, take away our paycheck and it's not comfortable. And so when we talk in terms of how do you create a reliable cash flow stream and we tell people, look, here is the traditional metrics as risk versus return and this thing called the efficient frontier. But that is not the same math problem we're solving for now. We're solving for this different math problem, which is how do I make your cash flows last for life with a very high probability that they will do so. And they get it. They, I mean, they're smart. Most of our clients are educated and, and they understand. Yeah, I, I totally think of probabilities all the time. <laughs> I just, I literally like go around being like, what's the probability I can convince somebody of this? <laughs> <laughs> and then I weigh that in my mind and try to make decisions, which is probably a terrible decision-making process, but it's totally how I think about things, which is funny, right? Because we talk about, yeah, hey, probability-based stuff. And I'm like, no, it's definitely how I like operate, but I'm, I'm weird, so it's totally fine. <laughs> Well, a lot of people think in, in uh, so I, I, I work sometimes with some, some gamblers, like not degenerate gamblers <laughs> like, or anything like that. Yeah, I work with a lot of gamblers. Uh, I owe some money. <laughs> you know, if I'm walking with a limp tomorrow, you know what happened. No, but they, they think statistically and probabilities yeah. as well. You, you know, you have a hand in front of you and you know statistically what you have versus mm -hmm. what your opponent has and so forth. But, you know, when you start to change some of the conversation about from probabilities to more kind of consequences and, and maybe what your exposure is to yeah. some of these, these conversations, it, it changes the, the math a lot and it changes uh, the ability for people to make good decisions they'll oftentimes make obviously poor decisions when they they don't see those uh, those mathematical um well, yeah, and I think the other thing you have to factor in is the probability of human behavior. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, I was talking to one of the advisors in, at a lunch break, and uh, he was like, well, in your presentation, are you going to go into all the research on why this process is better? And I said, well, actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all kinds of research on, you know, should you use a bucketing strategy or not? Should you do this? And depending on which research you pull, it might say one looks better, and the next paper comes out and says a different way looks better. But you have to factor human behavior. And that's what you were just talking about is, you know, what's the probability my client's going to stick with the portfolio? And when you've been able to frame it and explain it in terms of this paycheck replacement or the safe part of your portfolio versus the growth part, we have clients during market downturns that will email us now and say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad. They'll even use our language sometimes. I'm so glad I have this bond ladder in place. I understand that this market downturn has no impact on my ability to draw a paycheck right now. And we'll think, wow, they, they get it. And so it's not that we never have nervous clients. Of course, we still have nervous clients when the market goes down, but it really does change things. And so I think the right portfolio choice you have to factor in not just all the statistics but how do humans behave do, do you see that when they have an income 
ladder or you know some type of uh, you know runway as you've used that term and whatnot do you feel like it gives them behavioral benefits that you can then draw on to make other better decisions in the portfolio does it give them a a, a sense of permission to to maybe spend more or to be more aggressive in the in the sort of the growth side of the portfolio or a confidence boost I guess too right yeah you know so some of the research out there suggests that um, you know, people don't feel comfortable in retirement. Sometimes, especially wealthy, affluent people, they don't spend as much as they they can because they, you know, they're savers by nature. But at the the actual presence of having some type of income ladder, you know, that's that's whether it's a, a guaranteed type product or something else, yeah. that the presence actually gives them permission to spend or to maybe take on more risk on the on on the equity side of their portfolio. Uh, so there's there's behavioral benefits to having that paycheck replacement in place. Yeah, there are. I mean, I definitely see the the behavioral aspect. We explain to clients, you know, we're taking less risk on the safe side of your portfolio so that we can take more risk on the growth side. So absolutely, we do that. But where I, I see their confidence or their ability to spend or feel comfortable spending more comes is actually from the planning that happens before the implementation of that portfolio. So there's a series of stress tests that we use, and we're running out this model that uses 5% rates of return on average after fees is what we're projecting. And then we're testing it if, as if the portfolio only earned four and three. We're using 3% inflation, 5% inflation on healthcare. I think I talked about that. Mm -hmm. And so when they see the results of that projection, model and how much they're going to have left, even though it's it's the same dollar amount in today's dollars to them. They're like, well, let's say they have four million today and they're still going to have four million in 30 years. Well, it's not really going to be worth four four million in 30 years, but they'll still say, well, I don't want to leave four million dollars to my kids. They're going to be fine. Could I spend more along the way? And so we think it's more that modeling process that helps people feel comfortable spending a little bit more. And overwhelmingly, I would say, you know, it's nine out of 10 clients that come in that are surprised by how well their plan's going to work and that they can spend what they want. And then maybe one out of 10 that we have to have the opposite kind of conversation. Now, I know a lot of advisors get phone calls, like especially during like now where market conditions are very volatile and uncertain and inflation and raising interest rates and all sorts of advisors are getting panicked phone calls from their clients. Yeah. I, I don't imagine you're getting a lot of panicked phone calls from your clients. I, one, we got one and, and he was miscalculating his investment return. Somehow he thought this fund he had was down 28% and it was down 2.8%. And so that was a fun <laughs> conversation to have. Yeah. And so that was honestly the only panicked um, call we've had. I proactively reach out to my clients that are typically most nervous. And two of them, both retired attorneys, by the way. Um, oh, don't look at me with that one. You know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> My most challenging don't clients always are attorneys. <laughs> uh, but they were just remarkably like, you know what? One of them had wanted to go to cash right before the last election. Mm. And I don't know how I talked him out of it, but thank goodness I did. And he's like, I learned my lesson last time around. He said, I, I don't, I'm not going to question you anymore. And so both had just relaxed. I think some of it has to do with how long they've been working with you too. Newer clients that are newer to the firm can be much more nervous than existing ones, but we really don't have that many concerned clients. You're right. Yeah. I, I, I love that that gets back to that power of planning, right? That ability to, you know, do all that work in the front end to give people confidence in the process that you're taking. And I think that's huge when we get to retirement income planning. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of close this out here on this one, which is uh, you, you gave a great kind of uh, talk about your strategy to retirement income planning. But I do want to ask the question about what does that financially free retirement look like for you? you? You talked about your dirt bike riding. Is that is that what you want to, you know, do in retirement? What, what would that look like for you? I know it's still a bit away, but you know, probably started some visioning, right? It's so crazy because I love what I do. And so that's why I say, you know, I plan to work uh, until I'm 70. And I ride Harleys too, but um, lately I've taken up pickleball. What does that say? <laughs> you might be closer About, to the retirement age now I than you thought. I might be closer than I think. <laughs> I'm reducing risk already in my activity level, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know because I love to write and I, I just, you know, I love 
contributing to the success of a firm. And so it's really hard for me to picture retirement in the traditional sense. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I'm always amazed at how many of my clients retire and they are very happy. And we tell them to give thought to it and what they're going to do and the same kind of question you're asking. Yeah. But it's really hard for me to picture my own. Should I send you some shuffleboard to your house too? <laughs> Maybe that's next. Yeah, it might be next after pickleball, right? I might have to confess that... Uh, I'm in my 40s. My wife and I are in our 40s. We played pickleball with some retirees in our community, and they're in their 70s, like late 70s, and they smoked us. <gasps> yeah. Yes. They were good and uh, and highly active and, you know, very accomplished pickleball. So yes. My, my father-in-law is a very big uh, pickleball fan, and uh, David Littell, who I think both of you know, he, he started getting into pickleball too, but he, he was struggling with that, right, because he was like almost pro level tennis player and uh you know was kind of like you know if i go too far that way but he he started having a lot of fun with it too and uh yeah around the villanova area there's a lot of pickleball occurring nowadays too yeah one of my first mixed doubles matches we got our our behinds trounced <laughs> by two 70 year old women who kindly told us that the beginners often start playing their first games on the other side of the courts oh. <laughs> Was, I love that. It was awesome. We laughed for weeks. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, from your professional life, you know, again, you've built your practice. You've really focused on this retirement income. You've done all sorts of education programs. And, and, and I think you've changed a lot of advisors' processes. I, I, and so I, I admire that. What kind of legacy do you want to leave professionally around the retirement income topic? You know, it was always been my goal for ever since I started writing online in 2008 to really raise the bar in this profession. And so, you know, I think just by speaking to a different way of looking at things and how you talk to clients that I've had an impact on that, whether it's, you know, how you can be a fiduciary for your clients to now really looking at retirement income in a different way. Um, so that's the legacy I want to leave, even if it's just little nudges, if we can just slowly nudge things in the right direction and improve some aspect of what we do as a profession, then I, I feel like I've made a contribution. I love that. Well, maybe that can be our next program, the RIF, right? The Retirement Income Fiduciary. We can trademark that one and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Dana and Devin, this was a fantastic, a great conversation here about retirement income process and the impact you've had. I really appreciate you, everything that you've done for this industry and profession. You've definitely already uh, ha had a lasting impact on this, but I know that you've got a while to go and still impacting a lot of people and educating a lot of advisors. And, you know, thank you everybody else for joining us and listening to this episode of the Framework Podcast. Please listen to this quick disclosure. Investment products contain risk and may lose value. There is no guarantee that an investment product will be successful in achieving its objectives. Investors should consult their investment professional prior to making an investment decision. This podcast is brought to you by Carson Group and PIMCO, who are unaffiliated entities. This material contains the opinions of the speakers and is not necessarily the views of Carson Group or PIMCO, and such opinions are subject to change without notice. This podcast may include discussions of investment strategies. These discussions are for illustrative purposes only and may not be appropriate for all investors. The discussions are not based on any particularized financial situation or need and are not intended to be and should not be construed as a forecast, research, investment advice, or recommendation for any specific PIMCO or other strategy, product, or service. Individuals should consult their own financial advisors to determine the most appropriate allocations for their financial situation, including their investment objectives, time frame, risk tolerance, savings, and other investments. PIMCO does not provide legal or tax advice. Further, this seminar is not intended to provide specific legal, tax, or other professional advice in this podcast. For a comprehensive review of your personal situation, always consult with a tax or legal advisor. The discussion herein is general in nature and is provided for informational purposes only. There is no guarantee as to its accuracy or completeness. Any tax statements contained herein are not intended or written to be used and cannot be relied upon 
or used for a purpose of avoiding penalties imposed by the Internal Revenue Service or state and local tax authorities. Individuals should consult their own legal and tax counsel as to matters discussed herein and before entering into any estate planning, trust, investment, retirement, or insurance arrangement. <music>